Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. To drink or not to drink, that is the question. To drink or not to drink, that is the question that we are going to talk about in this episode of the Theology Central Podcast. It is Thursday, January the 20th, 2022. It is currently 1022 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church right here in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And I I know talking about drinking and alcohol in 2022 probably seems like a very outdated topic, right? I mean, how many Christian podcasts spend spends much time talking about alcohol? Maybe, maybe they mention it sometimes. I mean, it just seems kind of like a an outdated question, right? I think many Christians just, if they want to drink, they drink. It, it's kind of, it's not really controversial anymore. It's kind of very much accepted, even within the culture of most churches. Alcohol is really just not that controversial anymore. So, Why am I turning on a microphone on a Thursday morning sitting here in an empty church to talk to you about alcohol? Why am I even doing that? I mean, I'm questioning it myself. Why am I doing that? I mean, what's the point, right? Am I really going to change anyone's mind? Am I really going to accomplish anything? How many people are even going to bother to listen? I think many will just say, what? Christianity and alcohol? (laughs) Who cares? I, I don't even know how many people will be interested in this topic, but I feel an obligation. I feel a moral obligation, a spiritual obligation. I feel a biblical obligation to once again address this issue. Now, if you've listened to my preaching for any length of time, you know I have very, very, very strong feelings about this subject. Strong opinions. And sometimes when you have very strong opinions that you have, there's a danger that because you have such strong feelings that you present your point of view in such a a overbearing way that you immediately just turn people off and they won't even listen. I'm I'm going to ask you, whatever your position is on Christians and alcohol, whatever your answer to the question to drink or not to drink, and we're referring to alcohol there, Um, whatever your answer is, whatever your opinion is, I just would ask that no matter, I'm going to try my best not to be too overbearing and, and, and too, I'm going to be blunt. I'm still going to be blunt. I'm going to try to be as careful as I can with my tone. I just ask you to at least consider what I have to say, because I think this is a very important subject. Now you may be wondering what, 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 what led to a discussion about alcohol on a Thursday morning, January the 20th. What 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 made you decide to talk about alcohol? Well, trust me, it wasn't it wasn't on my radar. It wasn't on my agenda. It wasn't here in my stack of stuff that I wanted to talk about. It it wasn't even I mean, I, I had no even thoughts of of talking about this subject, but I woke up this morning and I get a notification on my iPad of a news article. And I look down at the headlines and I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. And here is the reason why. So let me so let me just explain it this way. If you know anything about me, you know I have very strong feelings about alcohol, as I've already stated. And those strong feelings is I believe that the best decision that any Christian, let me, let me stress that. Well, I think any person, I should stress it this way. I think the best decision any person can make, Christian, atheist, doesn't matter, is to stay as far away from alcohol as they can possibly get. Like if you can get 50 miles away from alcohol, do so. Just don't even get near it. And that is true of not just Christians, of everyone. I was going to to focus my attention specifically on Christians, but then everyone thinks that my views about alcohol are just based off my my interpretation of the Bible. And it goes way beyond that. It goes way beyond that. So so I think anyone would be better off and staying as far away from alcohol as you can. But anytime I express my feelings about it, 
I'm all constantly almost immediately hit with, but you do know the health benefits that come, say, from drinking wine. You wouldn't want to deny someone the health benefits, right? I mean, drinking a glass of wine a day is great for your heart. Now, whenever people say these things to me, I have to go, is it the alcohol that helps the heart or is there something else? And can we get those same benefits from something that doesn't have alcohol in it. Now, usually when I start trying to ask these questions, the conversation falls apart because they're just trying to argue, hey, I want to drink. And if I can use health benefits as as an excuse, then I'm going to use it. But it's not the alcohol that would bring about the health benefits. It would not be that at all. It'd be something else contained in wine, right? Right? I mean, do do I have to really explain it to you? But I'm constantly, this is thrown in my face constantly thrown in my face. Well, guess what I see today? Oh, I guess the medical world has changed their minds. Here is the headline. Daily glass of wine is not good for you, world heart experts say. Wait, what? I'm shocked. I can't believe this. You're telling me that alcohol is not a- actually good for people? I I can't believe this. This is the craziest thing. Someone, in fact, I, I should have I should have pulled up our news bulletin uh, intro for this, but but no, I'm not because I'm trying to look at it from a theological perspective. So so they're, they're telling me, hey, it's not not as actually good for you. Let, let me read a little bit of this for you. All right, this was published uh, today. Um, and just a couple of hours ago. So this is hot off the presses. If it, if it, was, if it wasn't on my iPad, I would make it the sound of oh, hot off the presses. Hot off the presses. The only problem is it's not printed out. It's, it's actually here on my iPad, all right? So I, I can't make that dramatic sound. Here we go. Any level of drinking can lead to loss of healthy life. Yeah, I know. You're saying that that's irritating. I hope so. Any level of drinking can lead to loss of healthy life. Let me read that one more time. Any level of drinking can lead to a loss of healthy life. And this does not come from just some crazy person sitting in an empty sanctuary in the middle of nowhere, Texas. I'm not saying that. So who is saying this? Let me read it again. Any level of drinking can lead to loss of healthy life, the World Heart Federation has said, as it sought to dispel the idea that a daily glass of wine may be good for you. In a new policy briefing, the organization said it wanted to challenge the widespread notion that drinking moderate amounts of alcohol can decrease the risk of heart disease and called for urgent action to tackle the global rise in deaths caused by drinking. Wait a minute. So, so they're like, wait, we, we've got we to dispel this myth. We, 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 we need to do something immediately I and mean, we need an urgent call of action to tackle the global rise and deaths caused by drinking. Yeah, 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 yeah I know. It's, it's, it's amazing how many people die each year in, in somehow alcohol-related death. But okay, let, let's continue. Uh, Monica Aurora, member of the World, uh, World Hearts Federation's Advocacy Committee and co-author of the briefing said, and I quote, The portrayal of alcohol as necessary for a vibrant social life has diverted attention from the harms of alcohol use, as have have the frequent and widely publicized claims that moderate drinking, such as a glass of red wine a day, can offer protection against cardiovascular disease. Let me state it again. Even if you said there was health benefits from drinking wine and it would somehow protect you against cardiovascular disease. The question would be, is it the alcohol or is it something else? And can I get that something else from something that doesn't contain alcohol? Every time I raise that question, I just get kind of like, well, well, it's it's just easier to get it in alcohol. Yeah, okay, of course. Uh, These claims are at best misinformed and at worst, and an attempt by the alcohol industry to mislead the public about the danger of their product. 
It comes after the Royal College of Psychiatrics, of psychiatrists, I should say, warned earlier this week that millions of Britons are causing themselves silent harm through hazardous drinking. According to the new briefing from the World Health Health Heart Federation, I keep wanting to say World Health Federation, that's the World Health Organization. This is the World Heart Federation. More than 2.4 million people died worldwide because of alcohol in 2019. Over 2 million people died in 2019 as a result of alcohol. Yeah, that's what a wonderful Wonderful product. What a wonder, wonderful, awesome thing. Now, I know someone's going to say, but, but, but people die of this. People die of this. People die of this. Just, I understand that people die of all kinds of things. That is true. But just stay with me because it's just not the, pos- the possibility of death when it comes to alcohol. It's the possibility of so many other issues that you should obviously be very aware of. But let's continue here. That this is equivalent to 4.3% of all deaths globally and 12.6% of deaths in men ages 15 to 49. All right. So they go on to talk about all of the problems that alcohol can bring from basically a health based perspective. But let's make it, let's just, just go to a different uh, study or not a different study, a different information about alcoholism. Okay, because the one of the things about alcohol is just not the possibility of causing health issues. It's the fact that alcohol leads to alcoholism. Now, you're going to say not for all people. I agree. But that's the thing. Like right here, I have. I have a bottle of water. Now, let's say this contains alcohol. I may be open, be able to open this up, take a drink. Let's say it's alcohol. And I have a problem. And I may be able to take another drink and not have a problem. And I may be able to drink for three, four, five, six years. And I may never have any kind of serious problem, but nobody knows when it's going to happen. But at some point, your drinking can then slide over into alcoholism. And nobody can say that alcoholism is a good thing for anyone, Christian, non-Christian, Atheist, Buddhist, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your your race, your creed, your religion. It doesn't matter where you live. Alcoholism is destructive in people's lives. And I know that this is like breaking news. I, I should have pulled up my breaking news intro for this right here. But this is breaking news, breaking news, a, a breaking news alert. If you don't drink you can never become an alcoholic. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Isn't that amazing? If you don't drink, you can never become an alcoholic. That is absolutely the most amazing thing that I have ever heard. If I never drink alcohol, I can never become an alcoholic. I'm in no danger of alcoholism. If I stay away from it, now, now, let's see. What would be the negative consequences of staying away from alcohol? Let me see here. There are about a billion drink choices. I can even get plenty of drinks that many people drink containing alcohol and get the same drink without alcohol. If you ever see me on a cruise ship, if I'm in the comedy club, you'll see me ordering drinks, maybe a Miami Vice, um, There's a couple of other drinks that I will. And guess what I do? I order the drinks without alcohol, man. And I don't even know how I can survive because it just tastes so horrible without the alcohol. No, it actually is amazing. All of the drinks I get on the cruise ship without alcohol, they all taste amazing. They're great. They're awesome. I love them. Anytime I, oh, there's another bar. I go by, can I get that drink without alcohol, without alcohol? They, they, they get to know me that after a while. Like, oh, you need another one of those? Let me guess, without alcohol. You're absolutely right. And guess what? I don't have any problems. I don't, I don't have any danger of getting drunk. I don't have any danger of alcoholism. I don't have any danger of doing something foolish or saying something stupid because I'm going to possibly do that on my own. I don't need any other additional help. But alcoholism is a danger beyond the health issues. So let's just consider alcoholism right here, all right? 
More than 6% of adults in the U.S. have an alcohol use disorder. That's about 1 in 12 men, 1 in 25 women. An additional 623,000 people between the ages of 12 and 17 have alcohol use disorders. About 88,000 people die of alcohol-related causes every year in the United States. It's the third leading cause of preventable death in the country after tobacco and poor diet and exercise choices. Unfortunately, less than 7% of those suffering from alcohol use disorder actually seeks treatment for the disease. Alcohol destroys people's lives. There's just no way to get around it. My daughter, who works, who basically for the state of Texas with alcohol drug prevention program, and she has to do all kinds of things. One of the things she has to do is people who have lost their kids uh, because of alcohol or drug abuse, she, she has to go teach them parenting classes and try to help them with their addiction and with their problems to help them to be able to get their, their children back one day. But when you, she starts talking to these people and their stories, broken lives, broken homes, domestic dispute, uh, dis- domestic abuse, uh, ch- child abuse, just horrific things. And 99.9% of the time, when you get, when you find out all the brokenness, well, guess what? It's, it's, it started with drinking, started with drugs, start, and it's like over, over and over. You see the brokenness in people's lives because of alcoholism, because of alcohol abuse, because of drunkenness. You would think that anybody would be like, that's just, stay away from it. Stay away from it. But it's somehow in our American culture, it's like, no, you can't have any fun without alcohol. You can't watch the football game without alcohol. You can't go here without alcohol. You can't get together with friends without alcohol. You got to have alcohol. It's not really a get together without alcohol. Now, again, I can understand. I can understand that mindset being in the, in the minds of people who are not Christians, I can understand that. But even, even from their perspective, you think, you think that you could convince them, hey, you will have a far greater chance of happiness in your life. Because look, this is, I really stress this for lost people. If you're lost, this is, this is in a sense all you have. After death, you either don't believe you're going anywhere or who knows where you're going, especially if Christianity is true, then you're going to, to be separated from God for all eternity and a place of suffering. That doesn't sound like a great idea. So this is, this is the life you have right in front of you. Make the most of it. Like if, if I'm counseling a lost person, I'm like, look, you've got one life. All right? According to your worldview, you've got one life. According to you, there, there, you, there's, you've rejected God. So you don't even know if there's a heaven or a hell. So you better make the most of what you have right now. So what can you do? Well, I can just give you some basic concepts that will help you. Avoid alcohol, avoid drugs, and you have a far greater chance of having a more pleasant life here on this earth. You'll you'll avoid those things that can destroy your life and be absolutely just decimate everything about. Stay just stay away from alcohol. See, it's not even from a religious perspective. For me, it's just watching it. Twenty two years in the medical world and seeing alcohol just literally, utterly obliterate and destroy people's lives, their careers, their families. Just horrific things. I'm like, don't do that. Just stay away from it. Just stay away from it, and you'll have, you can you can have just as much fun. In fact, and and at the same time, avoid. You can have just as much fun, and at the same time, avoid all of the devastation. How many girls have lost their virginity not because they wanted to, but because they were drunk and taken advantage of, or they lose their inhibition and engage in an action that they regret when they wake up. It's just over and over the, the things that it's happened, the, the destruction, the pain, the suffering. Don't even get me started about all of the drinking, dri- drinking and driving and the accidents that's killed so many people who were not out drinking. It's just absolutely the, the, the pain and suffering that alcohol has caused should just make any person forget Christian 
Just say, mm, I'm going to stay away. I'm going to stay away from that. I'm just, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Like the, whatever the upside is, it's not worth the risk. Now, I know you know a lot of people who may be able to drink their whole life and they never have a problem with alcoholism, never have a problem with drunkenness and nothing ever goes wrong. Well, that's wonderful. But do you want to take that risk that that's going to be you? Are you going to take that gamble that's going to be you? I'll never forget my, uh, one of my good friends when I was young, we were, I don't know, maybe, I don't even know if we were in junior high yet. Maybe in, even a little, a little before junior high. His father was an alcoholic, just absolute crazed alcoholic. And I mean, it, was, it caused so many problems in that home. And, and my friend was just getting tired of it. He was, his dad would get, it was a Saturday and his dad started drinking. And he knew that if his dad started drinking, that was going to turn into violence and abuse. And so he took, we, 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 I helped him. We took all of the alcohol we could find in the, in the house and we pu- poured it down the toilet, right? So we're in the bathroom. We've got the door locked and we're pouring out like all these bottles of alcohol, just trying. He's got, he's at the sink. I'm at the toilet and we're just, just getting rid of, and there was all kinds of alcohol, beer. I, I don't even know. I don't, I'm not that familiar with alcohol, but there was enough of it. And we would just start getting rid of it, getting rid of it. Well, his Dad was already like semi drunk, started yelling and screaming, Where, what are you doing? Where's, and, and, and he realized what was going on. So he starts pounding on the door, starts just pounding on the bathroom door. And he's furious and he's angry and he's pounding and pounding. And all of a sudden, the, in, in the middle of the bathroom door, it gets, ksh, something starts trying to break through the door. And he's using, I can't remember if it was like a, a large sledgehammer. I don't know what it was. He was using something to smash through the door to try to get to us because we were pouring his alcohol out. And I never forget the utter panic because I already knew he was an abusive person. And now we were trapped in here and it was scared to death. The bathroom had a window. We had to, we basically had to knock out the screen, get out of the window and crawled out of the window and had to basically stay away from the house the rest of the day. Fear of, uh, well, I was scared to death and he was scared to death of what his father would do. All, and just think, that's a father who's already been abusive because of alcohol. He, that, I'm, I can't believe that that father started his life out as a father, hoping that one day he'd be an alcoholic who was abusing his child to such a point that the child was going to try to pour alcohol down a toilet and then he was going to smash through the door with some kind of large object to try to get to the kids inside to stop it or who knows what he was going to do to us. Like, how do you get there? How do you get there? And whenever I hear stories, I'll never, I'll never forget. Now, this is not, it's, it's, I can tell it in a funny way, but I can also hopefully try to convey the tragic nature of this. I'm in the military. Two, two, well, there's, I could go through hundreds of, of issues that happen with alcohol, watching people destroy their lives, but it's Omaha, Nebraska. It's dead, dead of winter. It's probably, I'm not even exaggerating. It's probably seven to eight below zero, even without the wind chill. The wind was just horrific that night. Uh, it's pro- it probably felt like, probably with wind chill, probably was 17 to 20 below zero. It was just a horrible night. Now, I, I did a job at that time called NCOD, not a non-commissioned officer of the day. And basically my job at night for the hospital, I was, I was responsible for uh, death certificates, taking body to the morgue if someone died in the ER. I was responsible for admissions, dispositions. I was, resp- I, I had, I was responsible for security. I had all these jobs at preparing uh, the, the next day, same day surgeries. I, there were so many things I, that I had to do. Now, it sounds like there was a lot I had to do, but there was lots of hours because you worked 12 hours from six o'clock at night to six in the morning. There were a lot of hours I could just do whatever I want, which was great because I did schoolwork and I read. And, and so there was, there was, a, I loved the job. It was one of my favorite jobs I ever had in the military. I, I loved, I never wanted to, when I finally had to leave that job, I was in tears. Okay. I loved it. But it's about one in the morning. I'm walking around the hospital. Uh, doing all the security checks, making sure everything's good, making sure everything's fine, uh, checking with the people in the ER, making sure everything's good. And I walk around a corner, almost scared me to death. It almost scared me to death because you just, you're walking around this huge hospital at night and most of it, most of the area is like, there's no one there. It's all the lights are off and you're just, you're not expecting to see someone. And I work around a corner and boom, here's this guy standing there. Scares me to death immediately. I'm like, whoa. 
And then I look and then I'm like, what, what is going on? Because the man is standing in the hospital completely nude. He doesn't have any clothing on. And his skin is clearly like bluish color. He's been outside. I don't know where he came from, but he's completely nude. And he comes walking in from obviously outside. He has no clothes on. Clearly hypothermia is set in. Probably he's already got some frostbite. I don't know what's going on. I start trying to talk to him and it becomes absolutely obvious that the man is completely drunk, completely drunk, gone, gone. And I start trying to talk to him and he's talking, you know, I'm so-and-so in the military. And, but he's, I mean, obviously his whole career is about to come to a complete crashing halt. He, I mean, he's, and I had to try to get him to the ER. We tried to, you tried to make sure. Now I could tell there was a lot of funny parts to the story. I won't go into the funny parts for this particular, um, this illustration, because it's just, it, I was just sitting there looking at this man who obviously now he's destroyed his life, his career. And no man starts drinking, wanting to one day be walking around a hospital completely nude, obviously walking outside where there's snow, ice, it's like 17 below zero. Nobody, nobody says that's where I'm going to go when I start drinking. Nobody like that's where I'm going to go. Uh, Another night I'm, I'm, I'm working security forces um, for uh, off at Air Force Base. I'm working what's called the Bellevue Gate. That's the gate that is connected to the small town of Bellevue. It, just, it comes right out, and you're right there in Bellevue. And we're, uh, we're working the gate. And when you say working the gate, obviously when people are, are, uh, drives up to a military installation, you have to show your ID to gain access to the, to the military installation. And we, we're there. We obviously have guns. Um, and we're, because we're there to ensure that no one gains access to the base or not authorized. Pretty basic. I know you, you probably already understand all of that. Well, we're, we're standing there and it's in the middle of the summer. It's the middle of summer. So we're just standing, you know, outside. We're not even inside the little, sh- the, the building there because it's super nice. It's like, you know, 70, 80 degrees, whatever. It's super nice. And we see this car coming at the gate and it's going fast and it's just, it's swerving to the left. It's swerving to the right. It's swerving to the left. And I'm like, what is going on? What? It's coming at us. And I'm like, man, this car is not going to stop. This car is going to run the gate. This car is going to run the gate. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Right. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm like, man. So I, I put my hand on the gun and I'm like, okay, he's coming close. He's coming closer. And all of a sudden I realize, no, he's not going to even make the gate. We have kind of like a little cement barrier that we stand behind, right? Between us and, and the car. So, and, and all, it's coming. And all of a sudden I'm like, we, I just fall to the ground and the car comes crashing into that cement barrier. Boom. It hits it. I come up over the barrier with the gun drawn. All the other security force people, we got guns drawn. We're yelling and screaming, get out of the car, get out of the car. I mean, everybody's ready just to start. We don't know if it's like someone trying to attack us. We don't know what's going on. Everybody's screaming and yelling. The guy comes stumbling out of the car. I'm master sergeant so-and-so. And he's drunk out of his mind. Now, clearly, it's going to be the end of his military career. Lucky he did not get shot. Lucky, Luckily, we didn't do that. But when that man started drinking, he never dreamed that that's where, that's where he would end up. He never dreamed. All the stories that I could tell you of some woman coming into the hospital beaten beyond recognition. I mean, beaten beyond absolute recognition. I mean, it is horrifying how bad she is, right? And because her husband got drunk. So then we are trying to take care of her. And guess who shows up? The drunk husband. And then he starts trying to gain access to his wife. We're trying to stop him. We've got multiple people trying to, we're, 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 everyone's doing everything we can. He's throwing people around. He, we fi- Finally, the security forces come in. They have to basically beat him down to get him finally handcuffed. And he had beaten his wife, almost killed her. And because he was drunk. I mean, I could go on and on and on, story after story after story. Alcohol destroys people's lives. There's nothing good about it. So I don't care if you're a Christian. I don't care if you're not a Christian. Please, I'm begging you, just stay away from something that has the potential of alcoholism and the potential of so 
clouding your mind that you engage in actions that, yeah, later people may say are funny, but in many cases they go from funny to tragic and and almost no time. And many of you listening to me, you've suffered through alcoholic parents. You've suffered maybe with an alcoholic spouse. You know what I'm talking about. But you can't seem to wake anybody up. Oh, got a drink, got a drink. And then you have Christians who brag about it. But, but before we even get to, we'll, we'll get to Christians bragging about it. But just alcohol in general, just, look, I don't need scripture. I don't need Christianity. I don't need, I don't need, a, I don't need a sermon. I don't need anything. I can just look at the reality of the pain and suffering alcohol has led to, to make me go, I probably should just stay away from that. I probably, because, and listen, we all know alcohol clearly begins to impact your ability to make rational judgment. Alcohol begins to impact your mind. So why would you want to take, I mean, I I hate when people say, well, drink responsibly. What does that mean? You're drinking a, a substance that impacts your ability to think or act responsibly. Sometimes you'll, you'll get the little cliches, think when you drink. Yeah, yeah, alcohol impairs your ability to think. It, impair, it impairs your inhibitions, your judgment, everything. It, everything about it is just like, this is not a good idea. This is just dangerous. Stay away from it. But when it comes to Christianity, here's what I want you to think about. Here's what I want you to think about. You may not care about all of those stories. You may not care about all of the pain and suffering. I, I mean, look, I would just, I would really challenge you. Like if you want to, so I'm going to get someone who's going to email me and start arguing with me about alcohol. Don't, don't do it. Just, just ignore me. Just go to an AA meeting. Just, just spend a couple of weeks going to AA meetings, listening to people tell their stories about alcohol. Just listen to them. Now you can say, well, they're weak and they're pathetic. None of them started off with the intention of having to be in an AA meeting with the horrible stories of how they destroyed everything. Just go listen to those stories. Go to, go to any rehab center, uh, any rehab facility and listen to the stories of people there struggling with alcoholism. Just, just go listen to, don't argue with me. Go look at the people who suffer and look them in the face. What would, what would be the best advice that they could have ever received in their life? Don't drink. Because if they never took a drink, they would have never ended up where they did. That, it's that simple. But for Christians, I want you to consider a couple of verses. Not even about alcohol yet. Not even about alcohol yet. As a Christian, you need to clearly understand that as a Christian, you have very specific enemies to your spiritual life. There's just no question about it. The Bible is clear about this. We all know one very clear enemy to your spiritual life. Like if you're, if you're trying to live out a Christian, if you're trying to live the Christian life, you know you're involved in a war. You know you're involved in a spiritual war. You know that there are things out there that is opposed to your spiritual advancement and wants to destroy you. And and we know one of them, all right? I think everyone knows this passage of scripture. I'm just gonna read it because as soon as I read it, you're gonna go, yep, I know that one. Be sober. Now that's not a reference to, I'm not using be sober there in reference to alcohol. Just be sober, right? Make sure your mind is sober and, and, and you're thinking things carefully, all right? Be sober-minded. Be vigilant. Be on the lookout. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. You have Satan out there trying to destroy you. Now, let me just say this. If you really believe that Satan is a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour, and the people he's looking to devour are not lost people, but they're Christians, if he's out there trying to destroy you, let me just say, just, 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 just a crazy, crazy idea. But just say, if you really believe that you have a spiritual enemy trying to destroy you, wouldn't staying away from alcohol just make sense? Why do I want to take a substance that will impair my ability to think? Could lead to drunkenness, could lead to alcoholism, could lead to addiction, could lead to impaired judgment, 
and, and inhibition. Why, why, why even you wouldn't, if you're in literally in the middle of a war, why would you want to partake in a substance that, that would in, uh, greatly impair your ability to fight that war? If I know someone's getting ready to come walking into this church, who's getting ready to come try to beat me up and try to destroy me, I want to be as prepared as I can be. I want to be sober. I want my mind to have clarity. I want to make sure that I'm ready, that I have control over my arms, my legs. I have the ability to defend myself. I don't want to do anything to just put me, to make me vulnerable. Alcohol clearly doesn't put you in a position to make you more spiritual. It puts you in a position where you're more vulnerable and you have to, if you believe Satan is out there, just staying away from alcohol just seems like the last thing I need, the last thing I need, if I got an enemy who's outside of me, who wants to destroy me, the last thing I need to do is pour a substance into me that could be detrimental to my, me being rational thinking or could lead to addiction. Right? There, there's, everybody knows that scripture. Oh, how about another one? How about Galatians 5.17? So there's an external enemy, right? So the last thing I need to do is to add anything in me that, that would give my, that external, external enemy an advantage, or they could take advantage of, right? Because like, if Satan's out there to destroy me, but I'm sitting here, again, bottle of water. If I'm sitting here drinking and drinking and Satan's like, oh, I don't need to do anything. That turns into alcoholism. I've won. That turns into alcoholism. I've already, I've, I, I don't need even, I can go, I can go somewhere else. I don't even have to bother with that person. Why, why? It's almost like if, if Satan wants to destroy people, just give them all alcohol, let them all become alcoholics. It's like, why, why would I, it just seems, makes no sense. So there's Satan, external enemy. So why would I want to put something in me that would give the advantage to my external enemy? But there's another issue that I thought Christians believe this. Maybe they don't. Sometimes when it comes to alcohol and how Christians talk, I don't know what they believe anymore. But this one's pretty straightforward. The book of Galatians. Book of Galatians chapter five. Now I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, there's scriptures about alcohol uh, they're about in the Bible. I trust me, I'm aware of them. Okay. All right. Here we go. Galatians 5, verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Now let's stop right here. This puts this gives us the reality that we have an internal conflict going on. Not only do I have an external danger, I have an internal danger, and that is my own sinful flesh, my own sinful nature. I have a sinful nature inside of me. I have depravity. I have sin inside of me. And it fights against everything spiritual. The flesh fights against the spirit. The flesh rejects that which is spiritual. Now, if that is in me and I'm trying to live my Christian life, I'm trying to live out a spiritual life, and I've already got something in me that is already causing problems and trying to fight against me and can lead me into really bad situations then let me just ask you a question. Should I take a substance like alcohol and pour it into me that offers nothing but danger? Like at the very best, all it offers me is danger. He said, but it tastes good. There's millions of other things out there that you can drink that taste good. All of the arguments that Christians give me just make no sense. Here's the reality. I'm already sinful why would I pour something in to me to, to possibly even cause me more problems? I Put it this way. My flesh doesn't need help. My sin nature doesn't need any help. I know this is a shock, but it doesn't. My foolishness doesn't need any help. I don't need a substance that not only impairs my ability to think, can lower my inhibitions, but not only that, can lead to an addiction. We're already addicted. Every Christian is addicted already because we have a sinful nature. We're already addicted to sin. I don't need to now have been addicted to a substance that can slowly but surely destroy my life, my family, and everything else. It makes no sense. Stay away 
from it. Stay away from it. Here's another passage. So we have Satan. We have our own flesh. Oh, and then how about this? We have, let's go to 1 John. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All right, so we have Satan, external enemy. We have the flesh, internal enemy. And then we have the world system around us that does everything in its power to pull us away from God, to to fight against our spiritual growth. Well, if I've got Satan, I've got the flesh, and I've got the world, do I need to add the potential dangers of alcohol to that already deadly mix? Don't you have enough problems in your spiritual life? The last thing you need is alcohol. It, there's just nothing, I, I, there's nothing great that's going to come from it. Put it this way, for any supposed upside, like I was always told, hey, it helps the heart. It help, I, Man, I was told that a million times. Okay, now, now that's even being called into question. But for whatever supposed benefit you can gain from it, I, one, it's not going to be a spiritual benefit. That's a fact. Two, the potential dangers outweigh any of the so-called potential advantages or good that you could get from it. The potential dangers outweigh anything that you can gain from it. So just avoid it and stay away from it. It only makes sense. Just if you care at all about your spiritual life. And then Hebrews 12, I just think this is so important. Hebrews 12 because it describes the Christian life as a race. Now, if, if we're in a race, and there's other scriptures we could go to here. Paul talks about beating his body and bringing it into subjection. He talks about how people in the world will, will, will you know, do everything they need to do. They will discipline themselves in order to win a prize. Well, we're trying to win, in a sense, an eternal prize. We're trying, we're trying to please and glorify God. Well, why would we then bring anything into our body that would be detrimental? I, I, there's other verses I could go to as well, but I'll just read Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, one. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Alcohol cannot help you in your race. If if athletes will abstain from certain things to help them be better as athletes, can't we abstain from alcohol where the upside does not come anywhere close to the possible dangers that exist? Now, let's consider just some passages about alcohol that I think are important, all right? Because I, I think these are just very straightforward. Let me, um, I'm going to go, I, there's a bunch of, of ones I'm going to go to, but I'm going to go to just, to me, one of the, this is the starting point. And, and the reason I'm going to go to this one is, is because this really lays the, to me, the foundation. This is where all Christians can agree that we, we can all agree on this one. Okay? There's, there's so many things that I may say that I may have already said that you disagree with, but you cannot disagree with this. Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Now, many Christians will run to that and say, see, 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 I can drink as long as I don't get drunk. Fine, that's a, that's a good starting point. We can all agree. Now, I've already talked to you all the potential dangers of alcohol. Forget it from even a biblical perspective. To me, my art, look, if I wasn't even a Christian, I would stay as far away from alcohol as I possibly could because of the potential dangers of destroying my life. If I wasn't a Christian, the last thing I would want to do is do something that could destroy my life because this is the only life I have, right? And I'm probably have a potential of destroying my own life without the help of alcohol, right? So, but from a Christian, we start right here. Don't get drunk. Now, here's the question I always ask Christians. What is drunk in the eyes of God? 
Now, you can look in your state and realize what the blood alcohol level is and when you are considered legally drunk, right? How many drinks is it to be legally drunk according to your state? Is God's standard more liberal than your state or more conservative than your state? Because I know this, you can drink and then pick up your Bible and it's not going to go, hey, you've got a blood alcohol level of, it's not going to give you any indication. <laughs> it's not, there, the, it's just the Bible says, don't get drunk. What is drunkenness according to God? I don't know. I know the minute I get drunk, I've committed a sin. So what is it? What is required? If you just get like that, quote unquote, a buzz. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Is, is that drunkenness according to God? No, the Christians can never really give me a good answer here. Like, well, you know, you can have this many beers. I mean, as long as you don't, and they, and they, they it's some relativistic nonsense here. So is getting drunk a sin or not? Is, is it, is, 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 is it, I mean, which, which is it? And, and nobody really can ever tell me. So, so that, that one I think is a good starting point. And then here's one that I love. Proverbs chapter 20, Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs has lots to say in regards to this subject. Proverbs chapter 20, verse one. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's pretty straightforward. That's a warning. Wine is a mocker. And if you are deceived by it, you're not wise. Don't be deceived by alcohol. Alcohol is deceptive. Don't be deceived by it. Now, it, we already are prone to deception. The last thing I need, pride can deceive us. Alcohol can deceive us. Okay, Satan can deceive us. We, there's, there's, all, there's false teachers who can deceive us. There's all, all kinds of things who can deceive us. The last thing we need to do is take a substance willingly into our body that is, uh, that is uh, a mocker and that anyone who's deceived by it is not wise. We don't want to take any substance into our body that can also deceive us. We, we don't want to do that. We, we don't want to do that. All right. Um, there's... Um, a lot I could say in regards to that, but I won't right now. Um, I will say this, all right? <sighs> There's a lot here I could say. If, if You probably have heard of the pastor Perry Noble. In 2016, he was fired after 16 years at New Spring Church in Anderson, South Carolina, because of alcohol abuse. Now, I've heard him preach since everything happened, and I hope that he has, you know, been restored. I hope he accepted discipline, and I hope everything is great. But it's just, again, his ministry was destroyed because of alcohol. Now, there's so many different factors out there that can destroy your ministry. There's so many. There's so many things that you can do to hurt others and hurt yourself. I know, I've heard people, I've had my own issues. But, the last thing you want to do is willingly take a substance into your body that can be detrimental. But here's what's crazy. Another example is Jess Campbell, pastor of Highlands Community Church in Washington, who had to resign in December 2020 after he was arrested for drinking under the influence of alcohol. All right. Now, I, there's another church here that's very famous that could get people very upset about. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention some of this. All right. In 2016, Apologia Church in Phoenix, Arizona, had a Reform Con conference, Reform Con conference, that included a time of talking theology over beer at a local pub. Now, this is very popular within Reformed churches. It's almost like, hey, we're Reformed and we can drink. And then they brag about the drinking, create situations where we're going to meet in a bar and talk theology because, you know, that's how the reformers did it. And the thing is, they will do all of these events which promotes alcohol, right? But they never consider the possible dangers that could arise from that drinking, 
all right? Apologia Church went on to say, to, they also sponsored a booze and tattoo event and published a promotional video online. One of the men featured in the video was, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to try to give names here, was the son-in-law, son-in-law of someone very famous who's a part of Apologia Church. That individual subsequently fell off the wagon, fell into sin, ended up in rehab and divorced. And that's from a news article. I'm not going to give the names there because I don't want to just heap, you know, shame and blame on people. But again, alcohol, alcohol. Now, I don't know if, if that event at the church was a, a, a detrimental part for his spiritual, his spiritual life. But I can tell you this, obviously the person shouldn't have been drinking. And the church, instead of trying to keep people from alcohol, was holding events sponsoring alcohol. Why would you do that? Why would you say, hey, we're going we're gonna to show our spirituality by promoting alcohol? There's going to be someone in the group who you're going to destroy their lives. You just as well say, hey, man, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk theology as we watch porn. They say, well, porn is different than alcohol. Well, both have addictive qualities and both can destroy people's lives. You say, well, alcohol is not a sin in and of itself. I agree. I'm not, I'm not in any way saying it's a sin to drink. I'm not saying that because I can't go beyond scripture. What I can say is that there's enough evidence around you of its potential danger. And then all of the warning signs that, hey, you've got an external enemy, Satan. You've got an internal enemy, the flesh. You've got the world around you. The last thing you need to do is put a substance in your body that literally puts you vulnerable to all of these attacks. Let's go to Proverbs 23. I'm running out of time here. Proverbs 23. We could spend weeks talking about this. Proverbs 23. We'll start in verse 19. Proverbs 23, 19. Hear thou, my son... And be wise and guide thy and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Now, this is a warning about people who drink. Now, it's also a warning about gluttons. Right? And gluttony is not even considered a sin in the American church because the American church can't have an activity with giving people food so they can shove it down their throats. Don't even get me started on the church, the church promoting, hey, we got to eat. Hey, well, we're going to get together. What are we going to do? Well, we have to have food because we can't just get together and I don't know, you know, spend time in God's word. It's always got to be food related, but that's a whole different story. All right. Um, but wine bibbers is mentioned right there. All right. Uh, verse 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth, sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Then, so it's telling you, hey, pay attention, get the truth. And then look what starts in verse 29. Here we go. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Now, I, I, would, I don't think there's anyone out there who, you know what I need? I need to drink a substance that's going to bring woe, sorrow, contentions, babbling, wounds, and redness of eyes. But who gets all of those things? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Like just, it just, it's warning you of the dangers. It's just, it's warning you. Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its, his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as, as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shall thou say, and I was sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it again. That's just, I mean, if that doesn't 
warn you enough about the dangers of alcohol, I don't know what will. Alcohol destroys you. Alcohol hurts you. Alcohol causes you to see and say things you shouldn't see and say. And you're going to rise up and want it again because there's an addictive quality to it. Now, I know this will raise questions, but, 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 but people in the Bible drank wine. Well, let, let's, let's just immediately just quickly address this, all right? I know some people say, well, they added water to the wine. I, you can, I, I'm not here to get into all of those never-ending arguments. And some people say, well, it wasn't wine. It was grape juice. I'm not here. It was fermented. It, I'm not here to get into all of that. Here's what I know. When you live in a culture where the water supply is greatly, 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 greatly questionable at the very minimum to downright dangerous because of the pollution in the water, because of how their water systems were designed and where the sewage went and just water wasn't, it was either scarce or in many cases, not the most best thing in the world to drink. If you find yourself in that situation where you don't have any other options, then by all means, drink wine. Okay, there, there you go. There you go. But th- we don't live in that day and age. We don't live in that situation. We're not in that historical context. Now, I got bottled water right here. All right, pure water, perfect taste, right? I got, see, what is this one? Let's see, all of these are the same kind, all right? I got bottles and bottles of water. Oh, no, here, uh, Dasani, purified water, enhanced with minerals for a pure, fresh taste. I got bottles and bottles of water. I don't, I don't need to worry about, oh, well, is that water going to be clean? Is that water going to give me some disease and I'm going to get sick? Nope, don't have that. Not only that, I have got millions of drink options. I've got everything. And guess what? I can get grape juice without any alcohol in it, right? They've developed systems to keep me, to be able to give me the fruit of the vine without the alcohol. Isn't that great? I don't have to worry about it fermenting. I don't have to do, I, I get access to everything. The point is you don't need it anymore. So don't, don't try to use that as an excuse. I'm, but again, let me make it very clear. I cannot say drinking is a sin because the Bible would not allow me to do that, right? Now, I, I've got an article here where they try to put forth that argument. I just think it's questionable at best. Here's what I know. Drunkenness is a sin, but I don't know exactly when I would be drunk. And I know this, there's warning after warning after warning of all the dangers alcohol presents itself. And I know this, that I've got an external enemy who wants to destroy me. I got my own flesh that wants to destroy me. And I got a world system who hates everything about my spirituality. So the last thing I need to do is add something else into the mix that is detrimental to my spiritual life and can put me in a position where I cannot glorify glorify God. And I know this, that I may have the liberty to do something, but it still may not be the wise thing to do. And not only that, the last thing you want to do is to make sure you're doing something that contributes to someone else's spiritual demise because you're putting alcohol in front of them. I wonder how many churches who do these alcohol-related events so they can be cool and edgy. Ooh, man, look at you. You're having a booze and tattoo event. Whoa, you're, ta- you're, you're going to have a theology and beer get together. Ooh, look how cool you are. You're so reformed. You're so awesome. You're so spiritual. Wow, man, I want to be like you when I grow up. Give me a break. It just, to me, it looks like, it, it look, it, it, you know what it reminds me of when the church does this? It looks like the kid standing on the, you know, sta- as, a, as at school with a bunch of friends and he pulls out the pack of cigarettes, taps the top of it, pulls out that cigarette, wants everyone to see, look at me, I'm smoking, Ooh, I'm edgy, I'm, re- I'm rebellious, look at me, look at how cool I am. Now, I know that's kind of a dated idea, but you get the idea. In other words, you see a young person doing something just to try to show how edgy they are. When churches are out there like, we're doing this alcohol event. Whoa, you're so cool, man. I wish I could be like your church. But you know what? What about the people who you end up destroying their lives because you, you're you telling them that what that having alcohol as a part of their spiritual life is perfectly okay. There's nothing good that can come from it. How about just have an event where you get together and talk about alcohol? And why even having a tattoo event? What in the world is a church doing a booze and tattoo event? What, what kind of garbage is that? And, and the sad part, the, the very famous person associated with that church, why, why would you, why would, oh, don't even get me started there. Don't even get me started there. But that's, I just wanted to, I know I spent an hour doing it this morning. It wasn't even one of my high priorities. I know what it is a high priority. 
because I'm just tired of seeing people's lives get destroyed by just something they decide to drink for crying out loud. Look, your Christian life, you're going you're gonna to make enough mistakes. You're going to sin enough, just like me, All right? We make enough mistakes. There's enough to destroy our lives. Just don't, don't let it be because something you drink. That's the one thing that's easy to avoid. Like there's so many things like you don't have, look, let me, let me try to explain this. I'll, I'll compare it to, to sexual sin. Sex, you have a built in natural desire and hunger for it. It's a part of your being. Okay. That's already enough. You have to fight. Drinking, you just have thirst, but it doesn't have to be for, in other words, your thirst doesn't say, "Mm, I need alcohol. I need alcohol. No, it just needs something to quench the thirst, water, whatever the case is going to be, right? That that, that will quench that thirst. You don't have a built in hunger for alcohol. So for any alcohol related sins, you see how foolish it is. You didn't have an inward desire for it. You chose to just go partake in it and then it can flip the lever where it turns into an addiction. There was no there was no inherent desire for alcohol. You just chose to take something that is already dangerous and you chose to do it and you didn't even have an internal desire for it. No one is like, "Man, okay, I need alcohol." No, I need something to drink. It that, if I start needing alcohol, it's because I've already formed an addiction because I started drinking it willingly anyway. It's it's just something so like it's just out there, it's available, but there's no reason to even partake. And if you partake because of, well, friends or, or people and you've got to get along with people and you got to fit in, well, then that's a whole different problem. And I definitely cannot relate to that because I could care less about fitting in with anybody. I mean, clearly, I, I condemn the Reformed churches who promote the alcohol stuff all the time. It's just so stupid. I've seen so many people do that. They, they become reformed. And next thing in their social media account, they're like, look at the, look at what we're drinking tonight. They got to promote to everyone that they're drinking alcohol because now they're reformed. Woohoo! I'm reformed. We drink. What? How about you just keep it to yourself and don't promote it because you're promoting it may cause some other Christian to go, well, if they can drink, I can drink. And the next thing you know, 10 years later, that other person is an alcoholic and you don't care because you've moved on with your life proving how edgy you are because you can drink. The last thing I want to do is, is promote something that could destroy someone's life. There you have it. Some thoughts on this. I don't even know what day anymore. This Thursday, January the 20th in regards to alcohol. Now, there'll probably be another study 15 minutes from now where they'll say, no, 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 no. There are health benefits from alcohol. It goes back and forth in the medical world. No, you should drink. Uh, Well, drink moderately. No, drink this. No, no, don't. Yeah, beer, and I've heard a lot, beer is good for you. All, you look, you could try to find those articles and say, see, 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 it's good. You go for that. I will say this, for every good that you can argue that alcohol does, I can show you the, a path of pain, suffering, death, and destruction that it causes. I'll never forget. I'll end with this. Someone I went to high school with. It's Friday night. He goes out. He gets drunk. There are some people in the car. They're out driving. He wrecks the car. I believe the two passengers in the car, if I remember correctly, both died. And this young man, who was my same age, his whole life was destroyed. Not only did he kill his friends who were in the back seat, his whole life was destroyed. Done. I don't even... I. I, I, he, he gets charged. I don't remember all the, all the punishment that he had to go to. I don't, know, I don't know if he was charged as an adult. I don't even remember all the things that happened. But I just know this. He was no longer in our school anymore. And the two people that died in the drinking, in the accident, well, they were dead. All because of alcohol. All because of alcohol. Makes no sense to me. No sense to me. The inherent risk, by no means, compares to any. I mean, the risk so outweighs any possible reward that the last thing 
you should want to do is from at least a Christian perspective is put yourself in that, in that danger. And if you're not a Christian, man, come on. This is all you've got. This is your best life now. Your best life is now. You don't, you don't know what's waiting for you in eternity. The last thing you want to do is start partaking in something that could destroy your best life now. And alcohol has destroyed way too many people's lives. All right. You can email me your disagreement to newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. If you are suffering with alcoholism, please get help. Please acknowledge your struggle. Acknowledge your addiction. Seek out help. Please put it away. Put it away. Just put it away. And if you've destroyed your life with alcohol, there's forgiveness. There's restoration in Christ. His blood will wash away all your sin. Turn to him and just can't worry about what you did yesterday, but start taking the step forward today. You can't fix what you did in the past. I can't fix any of the mistakes I've ever made in the past. All we can do is walk now differently than we did before. Get up, get out, get out of the pigsty, throw away the alcohol and move forward. That, I'm begging you, I'm pleading you, not only for your own life, for the people around you. And you don't have to live in guilt and shame. Christ will forgive. There is restoration. There is hope. But please, just, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. All right, I'll stop right there. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Thanks for listening. God bless.